having grown up in the 50s and 60s in a world that was really divorcing itself from the source of all of its food. I got to Mexico and I, I discovered that there was still a really strong bond between people and where their food came from, the people that produced the food. I got back to the United States and I was buying produce that came from who knows where. I kept asking myself, how am I gonna make great food if I don't have any connection to the people that are growing that food? We have gotten so distant from the food that we start thinking about it as a commodity. For goodness sakes, it's our nourishment as human beings. And I can have an opportunity to have give and take with the people that are actually keeping me alive. I'm Marty Travis, and I'm a farmer in central Illinois. Each Friday night, I send an email to close to 200 chefs. It lists the product that we have available from Spence Farm, and then we deliver every Wednesday to their restaurants what they've ordered and we do all the deliveries ourselves. I usually make our first delivery about 9.30 in the morning, hit as many as 30 plus restaurants during the day, cover a pretty good swath of the city. We've worked it out so that we're hitting each restaurant when somebody's there to receive it and somebody there to write a check. But it's more about the relationship than it is the rutabagas. It's an important integral piece in the marketing that we do, but it's much more than just selling things to them. They've really become our friends. It's so funny that people talk about Oh, I'm a small farmer and I'm providing food for restaurants and I sell some of my stuff at a CSA and I have a truck stand and I go to the farmer's market once a week. That's what a small farmer typically these days would say. Well, that was what everybody did 50 years ago. There weren't as many restaurants, but restaurants got their food locally and people got their food locally. and. Most everything was seasonal. You look at frozen food, you look at microwaves, you look at super highly processed food, you look at the ease with which these things can be transported. Each of these steps made it more and more possible to say, if we grow a lot of the same crop in one area, then we have the ability to process food, freeze it, ship it from a central location to the rest of the country. And you're not saying, how do we want to feed ourselves? You're saying, how can we make agriculture into the most efficient profit-making system that we can? To start with, how do we make the most possible money rather than how do we produce the most appropriate food is asking the wrong question first. It is at a crisis point, but it's not a crisis you wake up and see every morning. It's at a crisis point where we have a healthcare crisis, where our land and water is being badly used. And climate change. Agriculture is the number two culprit in climate change. The way that we produce food and the way that we eat affects almost everything. Each aspect of that has big problems. 
it appears that we have a food system, but what we have is a system of using agriculture, food marketing, food production to make money for a number of corporations. We do get to eat, but we don't get to eat food that's green and nutritious and fair and affordable. And if those are our goals, then we need a food system that says, these are our goals, how do we get there? The winter season here at the farm is much different than the other seasons. It can be an, an incredibly beautiful time. It's about keeping warm. And also keeping our livestock warm and well fed. Winter is a season that I think here in the Midwest, we just want to get through it quickly. <laughs> I work on, on the farm with my wife, Chris, and our son, Will. My son, Will, must be at least a foot taller than I am now. I look up to Will in many ways. There's been a couple times where we've asked him, so what do you want to do on the farm? What part of this do you want to do? And one of the things that he came up with when he was still in high school was that he wanted to resurrect the maple syrup business. The native Kickapoo shared how to make syrup with my fourth great-grandfather in 1830. And from that time on, syrup has been made each generation. I wanted to do the maple syrup because I really enjoy being in the timber. The sounds and the smells, it's just a very calming, relaxing environment to be in. It's connecting back to a time that was very important to this farm. It's a sense of pride to see the next generation recapture some of that. This farm was settled by my fourth great-grandfather in October of 1830. In 1981, the farm had been in our family for 151 years at that point. My grandmother decided that she couldn't take care of the farm in the way that she had for years and decided to sell the house yard and the farm buildings to a conventional uh, farm family. And then for the next 18 years, the farm really was farm conventionally, corn and soybeans. And during that period of time was when the fellow that farmed the acreage was so excited that it was Roundup Ready soybeans. So then, my grandmother bought the farm back. And I moved back here in uh, the spring of 99. It was a very surreal kind of an experience in many ways. The buildings were in tough shape, so they needed repair. The house needed repairs, and the land needed to be repaired. The soil just didn't seem the same. A lot of corn stalks were still there two and three years later, just weren't breaking down. And the soil was hard to walk on. It just didn't feel right. Soil is one of those things that most people just sort of take for granted. And yet, if you think about it as a resource, it's sort of the most undervalued yet invaluable resource humanity has. It's the foundation for terrestrial life. It's the foundation for agriculture. And yet, we've pretty much, for the modern era, been treating soil like dirt. In 
If you look back at the history of past civilizations, you keep running into different versions of a very similar story. You look at Mesopotamia, to Greece, to Rome, to the southeastern United States, to the American Midwest and the Dust Bowl. It's a whole progression of societies that have damaged and degraded their soil and then moved on to the next place. It would be profoundly unwise to not look back and try and learn the lessons of those societies, given that now we don't really have anywhere else to go. I've actually been very impressed and amazed by how simple changes in practices can greatly reduce the need for agricultural inputs, uh, fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides in particular and buy us some time to essentially think about how to generate a truly sustainable agriculture. In a typical Iowa cropping system in which corn and soy are grown in alternate years on the same land, farmers are looking to have a high yield of corn by applying a sufficient amount of nitrogen to the soil in the form of mineral fertilizer. Weeds are everywhere in these fields and farmers have relied more and more on chemicals that are very effective in suppressing weeds. If we wanted an agricultural system that was minimally dependent on non-renewable resources and that was um, careful in its impacts on the environment, what would that system look like? We started working on this land in 2001, and what we found out is that we could reduce our use of mineral nitrogen fertilizer by 90% and reduce our use of herbicides by more than 95%. If we add oats with red clover or oats with alfalfa to that corn and soy rotation. This oat crop has this companion of clover, which is taking nitrogen out of the atmosphere and putting it into the roots, which allows us to back way off on the amount of mineral fertilizer we use. We've seen less erosion potential in the longer rotations. So we've seen these indicators of improved environmental performance, and we've also been able to maintain profitability because of lower input costs in the longer rotations. The basic fact that impedes the adoption of more diverse, less chemically dependent systems is that we don't put a price tag on environmental damage. Impairments of water quality or loss of soil due to erosion or drift of herbicides onto non-target crops. The so-called externalities are not factored into the production equation. If the external costs were added back into the cost of industrial farming, then it would seem much more expensive. It would seem as expensive as it really is. The argument that sustainable food is more expensive goes out the window when you recognize that sustainable food has far fewer externalities than industrially produced food. Scientists who work for the federal government have discovered a huge dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico where fish cannot survive. It is about the size of Connecticut, covering nearly 6,000 miles. Surface runoff is a very serious problem. The primary cause of the dead zone is nitrogen-based fertilizers that are washed down the Mississippi River by spring rains and into the Gulf. Suppose that you're a farmer from Illinois, and you get a letter from the governor of, from Louisiana, which has a bill in it for $234,000, and that's your share of the cost of cleaning up the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Kern County is one of several areas in our state that was found to have high nitrate levels in its groundwater. Increasingly now, the public is having to pay the cost to take enough of the nutrients out of the water, the nitrates, etc., to make it safe to drink. Toledo, Ohio, their water was found to be unsafe. Pesticide runoff threatens drinking water. High concentrations of nitrates. Phosphate pollution. They've never had nitrate levels this high. Health officials are recommending that pregnant women and children under six months old not drink the water. What flows from those fields is having a disastrous consequence on human and aquatic health. We have to begin to look at what's going to help solve this. And so here again, planting crops in a diverse rotation, it restores the biological health of soil. And as a result, you're going to have less flooding because you've got more water going into the soil 
and then during the drought periods you're going to have more moisture in the soil to sustain the plants. So there's a number of things that we know how to do and can do, but farmers are under this enormous pressure you know, to produce as much as possible. And the good bad news is that we can't do this much longer because we're using up the natural resources that we've used to sustain this kind of system. Even the Ogallala Aquifer, which is one of the largest aquifers on the planet and provides irrigation water for the heartland, everything from Southern South Dakota to Texas, at the rate that we're drawing it down now, they're predicting that it will only have water available for irrigation for another 20 years. There's 120 million acres of corn and soy rotations. But no farmer goes out there planting corn and soy rotations because they're in love with corn and soy. Uh, I've, I've actually never met them. What I've met is farmers who do that because the whole system is geared towards corn and soy. From the tractors to the cedars to the elevators, it's all built around that system. We better figure out how to create an economy for those truly sunk costs, which are the crops that are part of rotations. And as a chef, I feel the responsibility to create something so delicious that you create a market for it. I created this dish called rotation risotto. It's the nose to tail eating of the farm. What does it mean to eat the whole farm? And that's where I think a chef and ultimately a culture can play a huge influence on, on a system of agriculture that sustains itself. And that, that then you know, drives home the point of what is true sustainability. Spring is my most favorite time of year. It is this incredible energy flow up out of the ground almost all at once. It's not just the seeds we plant coming up, but it's the push of the buds of the trees. It's almost everything coming alive again. And honestly, it's people too. It is that period of time that things look very rosy, usually. Today we're planting potatoes, and it's cold and blustery out of the north, but at least it's sunny. You can go a little faster. If you keep a potato in the dark and keep it longer than you usually should, maybe. It starts to get those little eyes on it and it starts to sprout. Well, that's what creates the new potato. As Chris and Will and I began talking about this farm, we felt like we needed to create a different vision for what it was to become. When the settlers first came, they had to be sustainable to create food for themselves. We wanted to recreate a part of that, not just growing crops for commodity markets, but growing crops that we could actually eat and that we could sell to the community at large. What we wanted to be about was a change in our food system. We began our farm enterprise basically around the wild ramp season. Wild ramps are like an, a wild onion or a wild leek that grow natively in woods throughout the Midwest and through the South. We would harvest about a thousand pounds a week and we found a distributor in Michigan that would take all we could do. We also realized that we were supplying him, and he was just the middleman. 
shortly after that, a friend of ours invited us to a chef's collaborative meeting in Chicago. As I remember now, there were only maybe a half dozen chefs. They were all the main guys. And all of them said, call us. At the end of ramp season, nearly every chef asked, so what else do you have? And we said, we don't have anything, but we'll grow whatever you want. <laughs> That's how it started. And they began to provide us with lists of things that they would like to have. What we do is spend time researching as many different weird and new things that we can find from all over the world. All different kinds of tomatoes, kohlrabi, celeries. We've got some Mexican broccoli that's coming. Just as much variety as we can possibly do. One of our first chefs that we developed a relationship with was Rick Bayless. Rick has been incredibly supportive of not just our farm, but farmers in general. We had been buying this Iroquois white corn from the Iroquois Nation, and it was done in a very traditional style. And then all of a sudden they announced that they weren't gonna grow it anymore. I said that to Marty and Chris, who of course immediately said, okay, well, we're just gonna go find that corn then, and we can maybe grow it. It took nearly two years to be able to find enough seed to plant eight 200-foot rows. And we had roughly 63 pounds of corn. And he sat on his counter in the kitchen at the restaurant and almost cried. He said, this is it. The processing of the dried corn was one of the things that gave it its unique character. So they preserved the seed but then they also preserved the culture of processing that corn, which I think is an incredibly valuable part of that whole equation. Everybody's familiar with the garlic bulb, but not everybody does green garlic. This gives us something early in the spring to take to the chefs. We get a good amount uh, per pound, and it's a lot less work. Economically, we've made a conscious effort to not buy brand new equipment to save our own seeds, you know, to be cognizant of our, of our inputs. And it's worked, but it's at the scale of what we can accomplish and what we are comfortable with. The size of our farm is 160 acres. That's really, really small compared to the conventional farms around here. A lot of the guys around here would farm 1,000 to 3,000 plus acres. They probably could not make a living just on farming 160 acres. You know, if they get a bad corn crop, they're complaining that the crop is trash, but their prices go way up. Now they've got a really amazing corn crop, and they're complaining because the prices are falling out the bottom. I mean, that's what happens, though, when you're relying on somebody else to set the prices for everything. If the conventional farmers around here did not get subsidies, they wouldn't be able to make it. This year, our average per acre was somewhere around 2,200 an acre. They're making $400 an acre, maybe. You know, you look at that against their cost of everything, there's not a huge profit margin there for them. Most of our neighbors are really focused on high yields. That's what pays their bills. For us, it's more about quality, quality, quality. And then it's the relationship that we have with our chefs that has sustained us long term. If we're going to, to make a profit, you got to pay attention to all of those pieces. 
I think the message that the agricultural community stresses is that chemistry will create higher yields and feed the world. Organic growers, on the other hand, rely on a very important, well-respected science. It's called biology. And biology means life. And we talk about life, then we go back all the way to the soil. We're out in our farming systems trial, and we're in a project that compares conventional and organic. These are Roundup Ready soybeans. They were drilled into the ground here. You can see it looks quite different from the organic no-till. This is treated with chemical salt-based fertilizers and also with herbicide. The herbicide is not designed to kill life in the soil, but it's like a side effect. It just happens. There's always the pushback from the industrial model. Organic can't feed the world. And after 34 years, not three or four, 34 years later, our data shows that yields are the same, conventional right next to organic. When the soil is healthy, we have shown that yields are improved in the organic trials when there's issues of drought, up to 31% higher yields. So there's the beauty of growing with life. 2014, we created a white paper that identified regenerative organic agriculture as the answer to reversing climate change. And here's how simple it is, here's how it works. Green plants take in carbon dioxide out of the air, take it up into their leaf stomata, and turn it into a liquid. It's then exuded down into the soil as simple sugars. They give it to the microorganisms that live in that healthy biological soil. And if we don't destroy them with tillage and chemicals, that carbon becomes a part of that microorganism's molecular structure. And they hold that carbon in their body for generations. That's called carbon sequestration. Using yield as the sole measuring stick is what got us in trouble in the first place. We're exchanging short-term gain for long-term stability, and we want to feed people for thousands of years, not just for 50 years. This is really not about us. It's about generations to come. It's about our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren who look back on us. And they're going to want to know what is the legacy that we left. What did you leave behind for us? We proved that you could accomplish things previously thought to be impossible. And we did it for all of you. I think industrial agriculture, back in the early days when I got involved in it, it really made a lot of sense. It was really a, a very sort of seductive message that I thought had a lot of logic to it. We're going to improve the efficiency of agriculture production and provide greater food security. It was for the public good. And people like me, we believed it because it made economic sense. The problem was that it simply didn't work. Food is the most basic of all human needs. Man can manage to live without shelter, without clothing, even without love. Poverty, unpleasant as it is, is bearable. But man can't remain alive without food. When we had the uh, CBS special, Hunger in America, the estimates were at that time that 5% of the people lived in food insecure homes. Today, more than 15% of the people in this country are classified as being food insecure, and more than 20% of our children live in food insecure homes. And the other thing we certainly didn't anticipate 
is that the food we're producing with that industrial food system is not healthy, wholesome food. It's making people sick. There's a whole range of health issues that are going through the ceiling in terms of cost and incidence that are related to the American diet. You can track the increased incidence of those back to when we begin to industrialize agriculture. So we started off with something that made sense, and I don't hold it against the farmers that got into that system. I don't hold it against the educators. What I hold against is people that refused to see the fact that that system failed to do what we designed it to do. When I was a supporter of industrial agriculture, I knew that when we had specialized, standardized consolidation, that that meant fewer farmers. The idea was that we were creating off-farm jobs that were higher paying than farming had been. But then during the farm financial crisis of the 1980s, I began to question a lot of the economics that I'd been taught. I couldn't understand why these farmers would commit suicide when they lost their farm. Then I began to realize that they were so closely connected to that farm that losing a farm was losing themselves. It wasn't just a job. We were taking away the lives of people and we were destroying the social lives of rural communities. We were destroying cultures. We were destroying values that were far more important than anything we ever gained from the economic efficiency of agriculture. Sustainability ultimately is an ethical issue. There's no economic reason to do anything for some person of some future generation other than that it's the right thing to do. We need to realize that we owe a debt to those of the past that created the opportunities that we have today. And we can only repay that debt to people of the future. But with every payment of that debt, our life becomes better. Because we fulfill part of our purpose for being here. My understanding is that I'm approaching the age of the average farmer, upper 50s. And here in the Midwest, you don't see every little farming community, you know, bustling and, and being vibrant and, and surviving. So many of the conventional folks, even in our community, they're having a hard time telling their, their kids to stay on the farm and even having enough income for them to be able to make a life there. Early, you're way too early. <laughs> yeah, can you believe it? No. And that's where Chris and I really began to think about founding an organization that worked as a group so that there were opportunities for folks who wish to stay on their farms. That's what we did in 2005 by creating the Stewards of the Land. Part of what I wanted to do tonight is try to understand what everybody wants to do and how we can work together so that we're not all doing it at the same time. Does that make sense? The stewards group works together as a cooperative model, marketing their own things. And that way, when our chefs are looking at what's on the list, they're not getting emails from 25 different farms. They're getting it from one group of farmers. How many of you would like to grow spinach? Surely? OK. We're all doing it chemical free. We're trying to create better soils. If it absolutely doesn't work, it doesn't work, and he's going to have to serve okra or something else. <laughs>
building that cooperative model has allowed us to expand exponentially. We have need for 40 cases of sweet corn delivered on July 8th. They don't mind if it's frozen? Yeah. That's really great. Yeah. I am Beth Rinkenberger. Doug and I have Garden Gate Farm by Fairbury, Illinois. <laughs> and we've been in the stewards group since 2008. Having been raised on a farm, that's all I've ever known since I was five. To me, there's no better way of life. We actually have growing four to five different colors of carrots this year. When I got in touch with the stewards of the land, I could see that we could use what we have here for what Marty was wanting. At that point, I was excited to be able to find my niche on this farm. You should have seen the look on the local farmer's face when we told him that we were picking lamb's quarter and sending it up to Frontera to the tune of 40 pounds a week for a while. Couldn't believe it, because they spray Roundup and kill it. The April meeting of the Stewards of the Land was held at the Zaychuk's home. Kelly welcomed all who were present, and the old minutes were read by me. To make a living on a small family farm, you have to have people that are willing to buy your product. Without the stewards and the help marketing, we wouldn't have had the connections. I was super impressed that the Dwight crew worked together this week and coalesced all their orders and Cheryl brought them. That's really great. Marty won't say this, but he has changed the entire face of local food in the Chicago area. Not only getting that food to Chicago, but teaching the farmers that what they do is valuable. You all think you don't have anything, but we went to 26 restaurants and we carried product from 16 different farms this week. That's amazing. He just hated seeing farms dying and in trying to save his own farm, he's managed to save a whole lot of other farms in this area. If we've done a good job of instilling the idea of working together, can you imagine what this community could look like in, in 20, 30 years? Talk about food security and talk about economic development. We've done it from within. You used to know your farmer. You didn't need a label. You know, you knew who provided your food for you. And... But for those who go into a grocery store and never get to meet the farmer, they're trusting that label. And sustainable, everything's sustainable now, you know? How is it that your pasta is sustainable? And again, how is it that your blouse is sustainable? You know, tell me. Sustainable for us was the day that I was able to retire from nursing and work on the farm full time. Some consumers want to feel as if they're supporting, you know, their local small farmers. Some consumers feel that it's more sustainable. Some consumers believe that it's tastier and fresher if it's grown locally. But what isn't clear is what is local. On average, we found that people said about 100 miles. Processors and retailers, they think if it's a day's drive, but if Tropicana imports concentrate from Brazil and makes the juice in Florida and sends it to Georgia, is that local? I don't know. If you have a very effective package, every single customer gets exposed to that package billboard. And some of them buy it. And when they finally use it and it's sitting in front of them, they have the opportunity to look at the whole package. And we compare that 
to showing a 15 second commercial at nine o'clock at night, packaging is where the excitement is because it's lasting. It hits everybody. It hits you again and again and again. And so you're seeing more persuasive messages on those packages. There's something just inherently good about all natural. And I always say cyanide is all natural. The food industry doesn't provide the complete story. I notice that there are fewer calories in a slice of bread, but there are also thinner slices of bread. When someone says low fat, they quite often are high in something else, like carbs. I mean, if you're low in fat, low in carbs, and what the hell if there's nothing left in the product? Today, they're focusing more on what products don't have than what products do have. I think the biggest trend is gluten-free. Gluten-free oatmeal or gluten-free rice or whatever, none of which had gluten in them ever to begin with. If you asked me what's the single biggest nutrition problem we have in America, it's that the consumer really isn't sure what they should or shouldn't do. And everyone is focused on what is in their best interest to tell people. It's a brand new research to tell you about. Are these foods making us sick? Fiber and omega-3s. Eat more soy. Superfoods. Soy is bad. Basic nutrition advice could not be more boring. Eat your veggies. Don't eat too much junk food. Come on. Nobody wants to hear that. It's much more interesting to hear that some additive is either going to make you live forever or kill you immediately. That's much more fun to read about. Food companies are deeply invested in trying to promote a favorable image so that people will buy their products. They're very focused and they've got a lot of money to spend. Right now, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is spending more money on the childhood obesity problem than any other agency or government in the world, about $100 million a year. The food industry spends $100 million a year by January 4th just marketing, just unhealthy foods, just to children. Summer is a season that's coming fast. You're watching everything just green up around you. Intensely green, all different colors of green, and the sunlight hours are, are really long. You get long days, short nights. It's a time of, like, intensity, lots of intensity. It's the bounty that we've been waiting for. We try to pick our greens in the mornings when it's still fairly cool out so that they don't get all wilty. This week on our delivery list, we're taking snow peas, turnips, agretti, fennel flowers, just a whole menage of, of really kind of weird stuff. They're green beans, but they're called empress green beans. Empress is the kind. When they start to get that size, they get the seeds in them. That's really when they're too big. These are the best ones, these little guys. These are the best ones. This is one of our trade-up jobs. Will hates doing beans, so I'll say, OK, you do the garlic, you dig the garlic, and I'll do the beans, because I don't like having to dig the garlic. I don't like picking beans at all. Marty gets out of a lot of stuff he doesn't like. On a small, diversified farm, it's important to have great communication with your coworkers. We try our best to support each other as best we can. However, they think that I get the cushy jobs. <laughs> 
I don't know if Dad tries to get out of a lot of things. He does get out of a lot of things, but I don't know if it's on purpose or not. <laughs> Milling's not necessarily getting out of anything. We don't like milling, so he can stand in the mill room and, and do all that. He, he does a lot. How much are you talking a week? But he really enjoys talking on the phone and emailing. <laughs> The jobs get done, maybe not quite to everybody's liking all the time, but we do get it done. I did get to help her pick beans yesterday, though. It's not just about us. It's not about Spence Farm. It's not about Marty, Chris, and Will. It's about creating an awareness that we all are engaged and reliant on farms from where our food comes from. When we began, we were taking product to the local grocery store. And one day, one of our neighbors that lives about four miles over, she stopped us. She says, don't stop doing what you do. You're keeping me alive. And she says, I've got cancer. I buy as much stuff as I can possibly get from you guys because I know it's chemical free, it's healthy, and it's good for me and you're keeping me alive. It's even more important for us at that point to realize the scope of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And to do the very, very best that we can possibly do. It's a noble calling to be able to provide food for your fellow human beings. We had Greg Wade from Public and Quality Bakery come down and help us. We welcome the extra help anytime, honestly. I like visiting Spence Farm as often as I can. It removes me from the hustle and bustle of Chicago and strips away all of that superfluous nonsense that for some reason matters here. If Marty has a bunch of tomato steaks to pound in, you know, I'll, I'll go down and help him. Our chefs that come, they're getting to reconnect with the farm in such a way that it's really hands in the dirt. And it gives us the opportunity to explain why we do things a certain way. Along the road there, we've got red clover. We'll probably put that into buckwheat. OK. Well, I definitely plan on using buckwheat. My relationship with Marty is one of the most important relationships I've ever developed. As I was learning how to bake with local fresh milled wheats and other whole grains, he was also learning how to grow them. And together, we were kind of learning how to store and mill them. and. It's been a pretty dynamic process from there. We're both inspiring each other to, to be better. This is the white sonora here. This is amazing. Have you looked it, at, yeah. at it close? It's no, I haven't. Tiller. Is it really? Amazing. Greg's interested in lots of ancient grains, spelt to different oats, to different heirloom wheats, many, many different kinds of ingredients that he could utilize. I liked the story about the, the einkorn as well. It took a lot of searching to find it. I'm glad that you did, though. I, I think this is important for us as bakers, it's for, important for us as a community. Like, you know, I just want this around. This year, we're growing an ancient, ancient variety of wheat called einkorn. It's a variety that goes back 10,000-some years. 
you know, if this is something that really has benefit to a lot of folks. It does. I mean, like, I was able to make a really tasty bread out of it, like, awesome texture, awesome flavor, and have it still be fully glutinous, and we fed it to gluten intolerant people, and they were completely fine. If einkorn is able to be used by folks who have these gluten sensitivities, Greg can turn that einkorn into an amazing bread. And all of a sudden, we've opened up a whole new world of local, nutrient-dense, ancient grain flavors to folks who are missing that. This is exciting stuff. I'm, I'm so stoked. <laughs> <laughs> if we really want to change the food system, talking about vegetables and fruits is not going to cut it. It's important. But fruits and vegetables represent about 6% of our, of our agriculture. Grains represent about 75% of our agriculture, our, our land use. The Western world was built on wheat. Just as South America was built on corn and Asian countries, for the most part, were built on rice. But of the 60 million acres of wheat, we grow very few varieties. It is completely flavorless and completely nutritionless. Changing the food system means changing the way we think about wheat. Modern wheat is bred to have identical traits in each plant. And that enables a farmer who is growing hundreds of thousands of acres on a mega farm control exactly when to harvest, exactly when to irrigate, and exactly the amount of chemicals to apply. But imagine you're a robber and you have a key. You can get maybe into one house, but you can't get into the next house and you can't get into the next house. Imagine you're a pathogen and all the house locks are uniform. You can get into one, you can get into all of them. That is the danger of uniformity. Despite the vast biodiversity of land race wheat that has evolved for millennia and millennia, who of us today has heard of all these land race wheats? Who of us knows what a land race is? So take the cotton out off our eyes. We have to realize you've been sold a crock. And we don't have to buy in to a globalized industrial food system. A land race is a population of genetic diversity. Year by year, generation by generation, farmers selected and saved the seeds of the plants that did best in that locality. But farmers never selected for uniformity. Every land race is a mixture. You see movement, sun and light and air is going into the plants that are of varying heights. And if we could go under the ground, we would see all kinds of teeming biological activity, earthworms and soil and microrhizae. It's a teeming farm ecosystem. We're standing in the einkorn fields of Klaus Martens, who is a wise and experienced organic farmer. And Klaus and I are working together to restore almost extinct land race and heritage grains and ancient grains. By visiting various countries, I was able to collect einkorn from Bulgaria and the Caucasus and Turkey, where einkorn is originally from. And I trialed this diversity of einkorn genotypes on my farm, selected the best, and I gave Klaus Martens a handful Klaus pulled this plant out. This is one plant. What, do you want to count the tillers? We hand harvested that first little bit, and we saw an increase of many hundreds to one. If we said 25 seeds times 33. How much is that? There'd be 800 seeds. And the next year, we had enough to seed any amount we wanted to. The increase was many-fold, seven or 800 to one. 
increase, which is also a stark contrast to our modern wheats, where if you get a 20 to 1 increase, you're doing good. 30 to 1 is bragging rights. So modern wheat, typically you'd plant 30 seeds per square foot. Yes. And on corn, one. One or two. One or two. Yes, which is, doesn't work well for the seed seller. Mm-hmm. Modern works wheat great works for the great. farmer. <laughs> yes, modern wheat's great for the seed company. <laughs> Einkorn is the dawn of agriculture. At the end of the last ice age, early farmers were discovering this grain. But I keep finding myself digressing when I talk about einkorn because it's not just the one crop, it's the system. If we have a modern wheat field, the farmer believes this field is the system, but he's not thinking. It includes land in North Africa where the phosphorus was mined, parts of Canada where the potassium was mined, and all the fuel that moved all of it. That's right. Every agronomic problem that we face on our farm has a quote solution that comes in a jug, is poisonous, and costs a lot of money. I don't call that a solution. I've also found that every one of those problems can be dealt with by improving and increasing the amount of biodiversity. We first started renting this farm about 20 years ago, I think, and a previous renter came to me and he said, let me tell you something about that farm. I've got to warn you, nothing grows there, nothing except weeds. It had been farmed in an exploitive way. They were harsh on the soil life. And if we look at this einkorn, it seems to be right at home in this hard clay soil. So it's fixing the problem. And one of my observations from farming is that whenever we have a species be dominant, it's generally the one that's the right one for the conditions. And when we have a weed take over a field, it's quite often nature taking a problem we created and trying to fix it for us. Only we don't make any money and don't feed ourselves while nature's trying to fix our mistakes. We're at a crossroads, and I think we need to go back to what these early farmers did. If nothing else, use the crops they used for the benefits they had to the soil. They're part of what makes agriculture work. They're part of what keeps people healthy and well-fed. But we have separated agriculture into agri and culture. We have a real need to reintegrate that. The exciting potential to combine the rich flavor and health of land-raised grains with the artisan bread movement today is unlimited. We have a true opportunity to change our grain food system, our bread system, from this industrialized monster. Yeah, she's going to finish up these. I'm going to final shape fruit and nut. Um, and then uh, she and I are going to get on sours. Right now, we service about 30 restaurants. We do about 2,000 pounds of sourdough in a week, about 600 pounds of multigrain. For a small artisan bakery like this, is, it's kind of a lot. How could the staple product of so many cultures and religions have sustained life for thousands of years, and now all of a sudden in 2015, it's not, <laughs> you know? Look at the ingredient list on a loaf of bread packaged in the store. There's 50 ingredients in it, and half of them you can't pronounce, and the other half are probably poisonous. You know, now look at my bread with its five ingredients. We're in this huge celebration of everything that's going on in the culinary world. Chefs are like rock stars these days. Just because whole grain doesn't mean it's not tasty. But we wouldn't be able to do it without the farmer. Really, the best thing that I can do as a baker is to take Marty's really well-grown grains and just not mess with them. I've got two starters here. This one from the farm. You can see all the bubbles on top. You can see all the life. You know, it looks really nice and fluffy. And the commodity one is just really kind of lifeless and cardboardy and stale. A lot of conventional bread is from dough to loaf in about four hours. Yeah. Our sourdoughs and our breads take about 60 hours. Now watch your heads as you come down here. 
We start soakers and pre-ferments on one day. This is our sourdough soaker. This will start fermenting naturally. Good bread in the bakehouse starts here. We come in the following day and we incorporate them into a dough, usually with some sourdough starter for, for leavening. We bulk ferment them for about four hours before shaping them. And those will ferment overnight in the cooler. So we've got our sourdough, multigrain, olive in here. Um, this is using Marty's Glen wheat. Everything gets baked and then cooled and then sent out in the morning. It's called singing when you actually hear the bread crackle as it cools. And one of uh, the most rewarding sounds I've come to enjoy. When natural fermentation happens, you don't need to do anything. You just need to let nature come alive. The microorganisms are digesting the bread through fermentation and making the nutrients biologically available to the human being. These are some of the Glen Berries. We'll uh, toast them and put them in bread. We'll soak them and sprout them. We'll make power bars, that sort of thing. Grains have a natural anti-nutrient. And if you make flour out of a grain and don't ferment it, you're getting this anti-nutrient in your system, which is preventing the absorption of the nutrients in the flour. Greg is probably one of the most amazing bakers that I've ever met. Greg is also one of the most passionate bakers that I've ever met. I was with my dad the other day, and he had all these pictures of me when I was like five baking bread. Should have just realized it then, but um, it's, it's been a thing for a while, I think. I love pretty much everything about bread making. I love the feel of the dough. I love smelling the grains. If you're on point, it's an incredibly rewarding experience. You get to smell it and hear it crackle from the oven. You just feel good about it. experiencing is a bread renaissance. We're realizing just how much we've screwed up as consumers and farmers and chefs. And now we're finally turning that all around. It's August 16th, time for us to plant some of the fall root crops. We had a new calf born on the 3rd of July, and a couple days later we had a litter of pigs, guinea hogs, born. They all look good. Things are coming along real well for the animals, too. In the beginning, our whole farm experience never really included the livestock piece of it. And I never would have set out to be a pig farmer. But as we began this whole idea of recreating the family farm, we realized that we wanted to have some type of livestock component. The American guinea hog was, in the mid-1800s, one of the most common homestead hogs in the American Southeast. It really kind of fell out of favor as we began industrializing pork production. In 2007, there were fewer than 200 registered guinea hogs left in the world. At that point, they were more rare than panda bears. We began with a seven-month-old young boar named Sam. He's kind of the granddaddy of all of our pigs at this point. Today, we have nearly 50 pigs. We put our pigs, two pigs per pen, and each pen is six foot by 10 foot and we move those twice a day. We limit them to that because they will overeat and get too fat. 
Like a human, you eat too much, you get fat, and you're not healthy. Our pigs are on alfalfa pasture. We don't have confined area of manure, so we're able to fertilize some of our fields that we'll have small grains on in the years to come. During the winter time, our pigs are outside in their pens, and we deep bed them with straw and feed them hay. Their temperaments change so much after you get them onto hay rather than grain. They calm way down. Come spring, when they're ready to go back out on pasture, we'll take that hay and straw pack and create our own compost. So we're able to utilize a lot of what that pig produces. It's not about trying to become the largest guinea hog producer in the United States or in the Midwest. It's about producing the best quality guinea hog pork that we can and to give those guinea hogs the best quality of life that we can. I think a lot of people still believe that their eggs and their meat and their dairy products are coming from sort of the traditional family farm. You know, we sort of think of it as the backbone of America, and we assume that's where our food is coming from, which is, of course, quite different from the reality. These large-scale confinement animal feeding operations, or CAFOs, are the epitome of industrial agriculture. You will have thousands, or in the case of egg-laying hens, even over a million animals in one building. Because they're so crowded, they're continuously feeding various forms of medications, often antibiotics. A large percentage of the livers from beef and pork have cysts on them, they're enlarged. And the reason they're diseased is that they're feeding in these high intensive, high energy rations. So these animals that we're eating, they're not healthy animals, but they're profitable animals. You bring the feed often from very long distances and you then have this enormous waste stream coming out the other end. That ends up in the water supply one dairy cow will produce as much biological waste, as much raw sewage, as 20 people. So if you've got a 1,000 cow dairy operation, then you've got the equivalent of a city of 20,000 people. You wouldn't take the raw sewage from 20,000 people and spread it on people's backyards, you know, spread it in the fields. And that's basically what we're doing with the manure from these hog operations, these cattle operations, and things of that nature. Any regulations that we have on these CAFOs or any other industrial farming operations are regulations that have been accepted by what I call the agricultural establishment. The regulations give them legal permission to do things that we know are polluting the natural environment and threatening public health. This is something that, that really needs to be changed. There's a, a lot of wisdom that was handed down over the generations that was sort of tossed out around 1950 <laughs> about learning from the way nature functions. Plants and animals work together. Diversity thrives. Nothing is wasted. Everything is recycled. Things have to be restored continuously. And if you don't have that mindset, then you're not going to be part of a sustainable food system. When I was the senior attorney for Waterkeeper Alliance, I was working for Bobby Kennedy Jr. We were suing and criticizing industrialized food production, but we felt like we needed to hold up examples of the right way to do things. And we learned that the Nyman Ranch Network was a good model both for the farmer and for the animal, and that it was producing really good quality food. And eventually, I met Bill Nyman, who's the founder of Nyman Ranch. This was a guy who was kind of a hero to me because he was doing something very different from mainstream meat production. Come on, girls. Come, cattle. In the uh, late 60s, I arrived in this community. 
There was a bunch of people that wanted to get off the grid. We wanted to raise our own food and do everything we possibly could without relying upon the system, which we, at that time, didn't have much faith in or trust. As I got to know him personally, I fell in love with him and eventually accepted his marriage proposal. For a vegetarian and environmental lawyer to marry a meat producer and rancher, that's obviously, that says a lot, right? There's one of the descendants of our first cattle. Nicolette, of course, it describes it as one of girlfriend's great-great-granddaughters. I can remember well the first animal we slaughtered and the effect that had upon me. It did inspire me to feed people, and I applied my entrepreneurial energy to growing this business to feed more people, one animal at a time. And after several years, it became one farm at a time. There are many things that distinguish the Nyman Ranch pork from the mainstream pork. And the more people learn about the way mainstream pork is raised, the more dissatisfied they are with it. One of the things that we'd been talking about for a long time was having the cattle be raised entirely on grass. And we'd been experimenting with that for a number of years before he left Nyman Ranch. That was the origin of Beyond Ranch, which is the company that we have now. Our mission now is to prove that grass-fed beef can be every bit as good as grain-finished beef. And it's much better for the environment, the animals, and arguably for the people who eat it. This is rye, high-energy carbohydrate grain that the cattle will harvest by walking around and just clipping these seeds in the same way they would eat a high-energy grain ration in a feedlot. So when you harvest grass-fed beef, you want to harvest them when they've had exposure for several weeks to this really high-energy grass, just like a bear gorging on salmon just before it goes into hibernation. Just in terms of how much land exists on the earth, between 30 and 40 percent is grassland. If we think about the world food system, cattle are playing an incredibly important role because they're using that 30 to 40 percent that in the United States, about 85 percent of it is not land that can be used for crop production anyways. Even those people who choose not to eat meat, it's still important to maintain this landscape. And by the way, if you want to sequester carbon, this is the best possible way to do it. Where you have good grazing, it actually stimulates vegetative growth, and it keeps the soil moister. But also because the hooves are trampling organic matter back into the soil, leading to more carbon going into the soil and staying in the soil. thriving on this dry cellulosic material that we cannot eat and survive. These animals can convert this into really wholesome, complete food for human consumption. The kind of farming that Bill's been involved with for a long time has often been characterized as niche food. Neither Bill or I are really interested in being part of a niche. <laughs> we want to change the way food is produced in the United States today. We want to change the way people are eating in the United States today. I'm really hopeful that what we're doing today, everybody else will copy. I don't care if they put us out of business. I will celebrate that other people are doing what we're doing now and talking about it in the way we're doing now. You've got to love it. And if you do love it, then there's no better life, I think, for us or for our children. We look at the opportunities they have every day. It's a wonderful way for children to be raised. We can't torture animals for food, and we can't continue to poison the environment. It's just not a sustainable model.
moving into the fall season is kind of like you better hurry up and get this done because the end is near. Once the ground freezes, it's about game over. It's also a period of abundance. When we think of Thanksgiving, we think of this huge table spread with this abundance of produce and grains and meats. And sometimes the weather will change and you have to leave and walk away because that's as far as you can get. There's a lot to pay attention to. Some of it's luck, some of it's gonna be skill, and some of it's just gonna maybe be by the grace of God that you get by. But it's, it's all part of the experience. So this morning, as on many small farms, you become not just a farmer, but a mechanic. And it's a good thing we have Will to be our dedicated mechanic. I'm very proud of our son, Will. Probably the greatest joy I have is knowing that I get to spend most every day with him. We work together side by side, we dream together, we struggle together on, on many things. I have just the hugest respect for him and who he's become and is becoming. I thought when I was a little kid I was gonna be a woodworker because that's what dad did. Pretty much just whatever dad was doing is what I wanted to do. Whenever we got to spend time together, it was always doing stuff that he was really passionate about and just being able to spend time doing what he loved always seemed like a wonderful way to spend your life. It's important to be able to get to a certain point in your life and know that what you've done is not just for you and that you're able to pass the seed on and that those seeds can be planted for many, many generations. Hopefully, it will go on for a very, very long time. So if we can shorten this up. Yeah, get a stronger frame and get you a little sturdier plant, let's say. Today we have Gary Redding from Advancing Eco Ag. He's been to the farm a number of times this year. This tells you the genetic potential of this particular variety. So you want to memorize that. On the farm here, we're constantly looking to improve the conditions of our soils, making it such that we have a sustainable future. You got quite a variation of plant health here, but yet you've got one that's almost defoliated. And you have to ask yourself, why me? <laughs> one of the biggest problems we face as farmers today is insect and disease pressure. And one of our biggest fears is losing our crop to these pests. And this particular plant, that insect knew that that one was, that that one was compromised, compromised yeah. due to some significant difference in its root zone or whatever. But he came and got that plant and didn't even touch a leaf on the one next to it. Right. And many people don't look at plants as having an immune system, but they're no different than us as humans. We have an immune system, and when it is compromised, we become more susceptible to many things. Likewise, in a plant, if it's not got a fully balanced nutritional plane, those insects can detect it. As a matter of fact, that's their purpose in life. Farming is challenging, and if we can understand the whole picture, we'll have some amazing things for people to eat. 
Oh yeah, you could eat them. Got a little more bounce to the flavor, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. I've worked for John Camp, who is the founder of Advancing Eco Agriculture out of Middlefield, Ohio. He comes from one of the largest Amish communities in the United States. Came out of school at the ripe old age of eighth grade. Entered into the farming industry at the age of 13 and started asking the question, why? The challenge with our current agricultural models is that they are based on a warfare paradigm of search and destroy. Identify a specific pathogen, identify a specific pest, and figure out how you can kill it. And if the first weapon of choice is not successful, simply get a bigger bomb. Today, there is a lot of discussion about sustainability in agriculture. We cannot have a sustainable agriculture today. Our soils have become too degraded, our plants are too unhealthy. We first need to have a conversation about a regenerative agriculture. A model of agriculture in which plants develop tremendous resiliency to climate extremes to climate stresses to all types of disease and insect pests and as a result of those things farms become more economically viable Starting in 2013, we began doing a lot of trialing with plant sap analysis, which is the equivalent of a blood analysis for people. When we look at the sap analysis data, we are able to see precisely which nutrients are deficient, which nutrients are in excess, and often we find that it is actually the excesses that are creating the deficiencies. If you have excess of potassium, it will create a calcium deficiency, and you cannot fix the problem by putting on more calcium. The only way that we can manage that is by looking at the other nutrients that reduce that potassium's dominance. Manganese serves as a potassium regulator, and when a plant has adequate levels of manganese, it will tend to downregulate the surplus potassium and allow the calcium to flow into the fruit. What we are implementing on farms is a fundamentally different perspective on how to manage plant nutrition and how to manage diseases and insects. That transition can happen immediately. It doesn't happen on a farm. It happens in the mind of the farmer. This block, having just been recovered last year for the first time, it did pretty good, would you say? Yeah, I think the fruit quality is higher here this year than last year. My name is Mike Omeg. I'm a fifth generation cherry orchardist. My great great grandparents started these orchards and uh, I'm continuing them. What really triggered me to start investigating was that we were having a complete focus on just the canopy of the tree and we were missing half the tree. Really quickly I got three worms. They're moving all this organic material into the rooting zone of the tree where it can do a lot of good. One of the important things when you try something new on a farm is to look at the return on investment. Not bad. That'll make a cherry grower smile. We're actually making about $1,800 more an acre after our expenses on the advancing eco eggs blocks than we are on our conventionally managed blocks because they're higher quality. There's a good canker there. I think you can get a good shot of this. This is an example of a bacterial canker that has, um, we say, dried up. There's a disease in cherries that is a devastating disease, and it's one that's uh, faced all over the world. It's called bacterial canker. I just cut into this, and I can see a pocket 
filled with dried sap. If this canker was active, when I cut into that, that sap would just come flying out of there. The incidence of bacterial canker now is very minimal in that block and uh, dare I say zero. I was having to actually remove entire orchards because of this disease. For us to be able to stop it with our nutrition program is really remarkable. Our fruit has become more resilient to environmental pressures like rain, like heat events, and we've seen that our fruit is pickable and marketable when unfortunately some of our neighbor's fruit that follow a purely conventional management is not. I was a customer of John's before I ever came to work for him. And it all sounded really good, but almost unbelievable that you could build soil health to where it would be self-sustaining, just like a forest of oak trees in the woods. And then when I was looking to work for him, I thought, well, if that's the case, what's the future in AEA if we're working ourselves out of a job? And he says, we've got a lot of acres to overcome yet. We're in a potato field in the desert southwest of the United States. If you look down below, you'll see a lot of dead leaves. That's not from insects or disease. That's from a five and a half hour long freeze that was devastating. They browned off, they died. But within three weeks, they were 18 inches tall once again. This particular plant has 19 to 20 harvestable tubers. Normally, they'll run 10 to 12 tubers. So we're looking at nearly double the number of tubers per plant. This crop here was tolerant to a five and a half hour, 26 degree temperature freeze that normally would have obliterated any other potato crop anywhere. But because it had plant health, it expanded its adaptability to a wider range of environment. And if you take that concept and spread that across the world, there's only been so many acres of tillable land ever produced, and that has been shrinking down by desertification, loss of organic matter, loss of water resources. So one of John's long-term visions is to expand the arable land and regenerate that, and then by doing so, increasing the amount of acres we can actually grow nutrient-dense food from, and that will help feed the world. It is my vision that these regenerative agricultural models that we have developed become the mainstream model around the world. How do we improve the health of our citizens? How do we treat our land more sustainably? These questions are answerable. That's, that's not unanswerable stuff. But you first have to state your intent. We don't have a national food policy. There are countries that do. There are countries that say food is going to be produced to contribute to the well-being of all of our citizens. That would be an excellent starting point. Food is a really unique issue because all of us eat. And there's just this excitement about rebuilding the food system. We're trying to reconnect to our food supply, and we have to do it one little step at a time. And I don't know if you guys understand how important Spence Farm is in that. Because these people are not just farmers, but they're visionaries. We have a great opportunity to recreate a food system that's fundamentally better socially, ethically, economically than anything that we've ever known. Sustainability is not just about my children and my grandchildren, it's everybody's children and grandchildren, not just for seven generations, but for 70 generations. This whole idea of doing something to pass on, to pay it forward, to make the community a better place, that's what all this is about. If our culture is going to continue to thrive, it has to be on quality of life. And that's what the farmers give to us. Measuring wealth is not always about counting your dollars. 
Sustainability is measured in a lot of different ways. For me personally, I think it's the relationships that we have between ourselves and our friends and our clients that makes me feel very rich.